Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum 2016, brought to you by Infor. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. We're back, Riaz Rehan is here. He's the Senior Vice President of World, and the Worldwide Leader of Value Engineering at Infor. Cube alum, Riaz, great to see you again. Welcome back. Thank you, Dave. Nice to be back. So value engineering has been getting a lot of play in the keynotes, got to be happy about that, but a lot of people don't really understand the concept. What, what is value engineering? So in a nutshell, value engineering is all about identifying sources of value for customers, helping them quantify it. Uh, and sometimes the quantification is easy, sometimes it's more nebulous and complex. Uh, and then most importantly, helping them realize that value uh, using Infor solutions, Infor software, Infor technology, uh, and then helping them build a roadmap for the future. So, great, sort of frame, frames it. Uh, now, you talk about digital as a factor here. Um, digital is data. Data has no asset specificity, right? I could use data here and it's very valuable, put data in this context and it's maybe not as valuable. So how do you deal with that challenge with customers? You know, it's a good point. Digital is data, but digital is also uh, processes. There's a lot of processes mm -hmm. today that that have been digitized, right? And if you think about why companies go digital, or why they think about digital, they, they do it for one of three reasons. It's either to drive operational efficiency, but more importantly, it's all about enhancing the, uh, the interface with their own customers. So from our perspective, it's B to B to C. The third objective of digital is really about improving employee engagement. So there's lots of different dimensions of digital, and our job in value engineering is to work with customers help them identify the data sources that matter to them and to their customers, and then to use those creatively, bring them to bear at the right time to solve business problems, but more importantly, create new value. And when those processes are digitized, they become fungible, yeah. right, and componentized, in theory anyway, and can be used elsewhere throughout the organization. I mean, think of SOA for business processes, and you know, circa 2016, is that a valid analogy? It absolutely is, and I'll, and I'll give you a data point. Uh, some of the research done by Capgemini indicates that when companies uh, do a good job of digitizing their, uh, the interface with their customers, so digitizing their customer engagement, customer uh, kind of uh, interface, they can see an increase in top line of between six and 12%. Now that's significant. So think about the potential of working with a company that has multiple businesses and you work with them on a specific business. They digitize that customer engagement uh, and I, ha I have a few case studies to talk about and, uh, and use that as kind of a beachhead to do it multiple times and to drive incremental value uh, and, and growth. And that's a big imperative, not just for CIOs and COOs these days, but for CEOs and precedents. So clearly, yeah, you're right, it's very fungible. So how does it work? Uh, we heard today, um, your chief customer officer was talking about the life cycle, and she started with value engineering. Have, again, must have been exciting for you, seeing that. Is it the tip of the spear with customers? Or? It actually is. You know, our, uh, our president often calls it the tip of the spear, tip of the arrow, okay. uh, and so on. We want to be proactive with our customers, right? As opposed to waiting for our customers to come to us with an acknowledged business opportunity or an acknowledged problem, we want to be proactive with our customers and we do about 300 engagements a year. Most of those engagements are proactive. We are looking at our customers, we are analyzing the numbers. Uh, for a lot of companies that are public, that, that information is easily available. Some of them are private, but they share that information with us. Some of them are government entities, so it's easy to get that information as well. But we want to be proactive with our customers, and that's why Mary had us up on the slide, because we want to go to our customers and say, look, we have compared your performance at multiple levels to your peer group, to your industry, and we believe you're missing out on a certain opportunity, or better yet, you have an opportunity to differentiate and to do something special and to drive incremental revenue, cut cost, and eventually increase your enterprise value. So it's very proactive in that sense. What do you mean? Uh when you say proactive, you mean you take it upon yourself to, to do it? It's not a paid engagement or? That's, exa that's exactly right, you know. It is, uh, it is our investment in our customer's success. And a lot of our customers still find that amazing. And it's not as well known as I'd like it to be, but we have made a commitment to going to our most strategic customers globally, and we do this now uh, as part of a program. We go to them, we are, we are looking out for opportunities for them to grow and drive value and we will go to their C-level executives and their executive team and present these ideas and really get them 
uh, to execute on some of these ideas. So it's the customers with the big, biggest opportunity, maybe some of your you know, largest customers, best customers, however you want to, want to phrase that. That's a great freebie. Take advantage of it, line up, you know, the demand's high. You know, the planes are backing up for that service. But, okay, but, but now, so, are you a, you're not a P&L, or you are a P&L, or? You know, we are, we, obviously we have, we have to drive uh, certain revenue, we are held accountable to that. Uh, and eventually, you know, through the engagement, we want to make sure that customers see enough value that they, that they invest in Enforce software. The big win for us, is when customers, existing customers, expand upon their existing landscape of Enforce software, or when we get new customers to work with us. You heard a number of new customers on stage. Travis Perkins was an example yesterday. I thought the CEO was very eloquent about how they, they did it. Mm -hmm. Value Engineering was in, engaged with Travis Perkins right from the start. You know, you, you heard from some existing customers. You heard Bank of America, you heard about Triumph. All of these customers, uh, or prospects, have worked with us in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and today I can tell you that for most of our largest transactions, value engineering is engaged in almost each one of them. We also have a two-tier model. So we've taken a lot of our content uh, and we've put it into a set of applications called value apps. We started this journey thinking we probably have about 200 or 300 users. Uh, I can tell you now that we have over 3,200 users, which is exciting for us. And value apps is really our scale engine that allows us to get value engineering in the hands of thousands of users. So let me follow up on something that, that came out sort of implicitly. McKinsey uh, has this operation internally, business, technology. Um, uh, office, BTO. Office, yeah, right. Where essentially it's, they're providing strategic advice to their customers in terms of um, uh, applying, applying information technology so for strategic outcomes. But they're not close enough to the technology to link the strategy and the outcomes. You are. Um, do you see more and more sales, um, more and more of the revenue moving through a value engineering process as you move farther away from the back office and more into strategic functions? We actually do, and I'll tell you why, For you know, to build upon what you said. What we have in value engineering, and I think Info is unique in the way we do value engineering. We have mm -hmm. got the business side, but we've also been very cognizant of having strong technology and technical skills and architecture skills to complement that. And I think it's the combination of the two which is really uh, reaping dividend for us. For example, uh, we were working recently with uh, one of the world's largest private companies. They do a lot of work in, in the cardboard industry, right? And we were working with them to digitize their customer engagement process. Had we used the business only model, we would have done the analysis, figured out which specific sub-processes need to be impacted, figured out the value of doing so, given them metrics to measure, and then we would have stopped. But the approach that we have set it up at Infor, we work with them to figure out what their existing technology landscape is, what a prototype of uh, the future vision might look like, and we work with Hook and Loop on that, and then went two steps ahead and actually helped them figure out how best the infrastructure below that uh, could actually work to make this real for them. So customers are looking for us to make it real, not just to give them PowerPoint decks. So the hook and loop piece, help me understand, square this circle, how does that relate to no, no mods, no customization? Uh, because essentially what you're describing is something that's very unique for that customer. So you take that and then put that back into your into your software and make it available to everybody? Is that the philosophy? Not, not, not every time. You know, Hook and Loop is at the front of a lot of digital work. You know, okay. Mark Scabelli and his team run Hook and Loop Digital. They do phenomenal work in helping customers visualize the future, really understand and, and build uh, you know, fantastic models that help customers really uh, get a feel for what the future might look like. Right. What we do is more engineering. It's the digital engineering below that. We will work with customers to figure out how to take that and make it real. Uh, and in many cases, Dave, it's existing product. You know, we have close to a thousand products that are GA, uh, and, and I think a lot of those are digital enabled, they are cloud enabled, and so on, and we'll use them. In some cases, you know, we need to do net new development or we need to do something uh, new, and in which case we'll do that. I want to go back to um, this, this notion that you complement sales and quantify um, the value, um, but you're a limited resource. You can't do that for all sales, or even all, I imagine, strategic sales. So can you be a template for SIs that then complement your sales force? Actually, uh, that's happening today. I spoke about value apps, and value apps was built in response 
to requests, not just from other groups within Infor, but also our partner network. So Jeff Abbott runs our partner and alliance organization. He and I partnered and we built out this amazing set of applications uh, that was led by Jaspir Madan from my organization and we call it Value Apps. And we have trained uh, over 200 folks that are outside of Infor, that are part of our uh, alliances or our resellers, uh, and they have invested heavily in training themselves on Value Apps. So what does Value Apps help customers do? Well it helps them do a few things, number one, it helps uh, our folks and our partners really understand Infor's point of view when they're having the first meeting with a client or with a prospect. Number two, it helps them do a lot of the value engineering work, quantifying benefits, you know, figuring out references, understanding discovery questions, and we've made it all very structured, and that's allowing us to scale. And finally, it's also a great repository of knowledge, because as we use value apps and increase the adoption of value apps, it's allowing us you know, to go from 300 engagements, which my team does, to perhaps three to 4,000 engagements that we can do with value apps. So think of it as a force multiplier okay. that's really allowing us to bring value selling and value thinking as part of our core DNA. And right. that was really my mission Can uh, you talk when a little bit more about that benchmarking capability? You mentioned you, you structure it. So one of the challenges of benchmarks is you know, every company has their own set of KPIs, their own sort of set of metrics that make it difficult to compare. Now within an industry, sometimes it's easier, but still, to scale, you've got to have some commonality. H how does that all work? You know, benchmarking, Dave, is relevant if it's relevant. <laughs> because if it's, you know, and, it, and when I talk about that, I mean it has to be relevant from an industry standpoint, it has to be relevant from a business process standpoint, it has to be relevant from a scale standpoint. There's no point comparing a half a billion dollar company to a 10 billion dollar company. The economies of scale just don't compute. And finally, it has to be relevant from a regional standpoint. You can't compare a company in Brazil with a company in Russia. They have very different dynamics. So, we, have, we are very cognizant of that. And I'm very cognizant that benchmarking has to really be relevant, otherwise you have no credibility with the C-suite. So what we do is we actually invest heavily in understanding specifically what the customer's trying to solve for, and then on those four dimensions that I laid out, we find a peer group that is relevant to them. Not just in size or in industry, but in business process and in region, if possible. Are we successful all the time? No. Are we successful 90% of the time? Absolutely. And once we find that level of specificity, I've actually found benchmarking to be one of the best objective tools to take a hard look at performance and to find potential for improvement. At the end of the day, it comes down to bringing a fact-based discussion to the CEO and then letting him or her decide what they want to do with it. So when you build that framework for that particular customer, then what do you do? You reach into your, your data bag and say, okay, this, now we have to fit our data corpus to that model and then share it back with our customer. That's exactly You've right. You've got enough data to do that because yeah. you have 100,000 customers. Exactly, we have 100,000 customers, exactly. we have you know, 300 plus engagements that my team does. We got 3,000 plus value app driven engagements. We are generating a lot of, we are a big data you know, business unit, right? We are generating a lot of data, a lot of facts. Mm -hmm. uh, and facts are invaluable. You know, and we are bombarded with all this information. How much of that information is factual? So it's our job to be the custodian of facts, so to speak, and to bring the data. And what we do is, once we build the framework, we hand it over to our customers so they can start doing this themselves and we find that to be the most powerful thing. When customers are logging in and taking advantage of all of these fact-based numbers that we have for their own good. And how much, how much of the data is external to that corpus? Is it predominantly the data that, that you guys have access to? Or are you increasingly bringing in outside data sources? It's a combination of both. We partner with APQC, which is a well-renowned organization that does a lot of this. Uh, we maintain confidentiality, which is very important. Yeah. You will never find out what a specific company is at, however, at an aggregate level, at an industry level, at a business process level, you will get insight. So it's a combination of both. And that's what makes it powerful and compelling. How, how does value engineering fit with cloud migration? Those uh, two go together? You know, we're very aligned with the cloud organization to begin with. Uh, our, uh, our mission as Infor is to lead with the cloud. Because we believe, uh, you know, as our mission statement says, we are one of the world's, we are the first cloud-based business applications company and value engineering is leading the charge on that. Uh, so let me give you an example. When I talk to customers these days, there are five key technology levers that they invariably talk about. IoT is big, and you heard about that yesterday. Big data, big analytics, uh, fast data, data science, I club them all into one. Uh, the next one is social, and there's mobile. But what's all of this delivered on? It's delivered on the cloud. 
So those are the five, think of them as digital pillars or levers that we use today to drive uh, a lot of our solutioning and cloud is right in the middle of that. So cloud, you know, I wrote an article recently talking about you don't just go to the cloud because you want to save cost. That's almost a byproduct. You go to the cloud because you have this massive, elastic, supercomputer in the sky that allows you to do things that you would never be able to do before, right? To give you a simple example, and let's go back to our cardboard manufacturer. When the rep is sitting with the buyer and having that conversation, in the past they had to use a catalog, a physical catalog, fill out a physical form, and they had issues around designing the right box, sizing it, pricing the box, and giving solid delivery commitments. Today, all of that is now in the cloud. So when you're sitting with your customer and having that dialogue, you dynamically create a price that's relevant for the order quantity, you get a delivery schedule that's real, and best of all, you're able to do all of this quickly and a two week process becomes literally an hour long process. And those are the kinds of things the cloud allows. Without the cloud, none of this would have been possible. So cloud is central to our strategy. I mean, that's a complete change in operating model. Is it? We always talk about cloud as a place to put stuff. It much more, the business impact is the operating model yeah. that it affects. You agree with that? I, I completely agree. Cloud is now a place to do stuff, not just to put stuff. Cloud is also a great way to connect business units that might be separated across continents. And that's a big benefit as well, right? You don't have to, in the old days, you had to have instances of, uh, of software on different uh, continents. No more, right? You can actually unify business units, and because of that, you can actually do new things. As an, as an example, Capgemini's uh, report says if companies take advantage of this digital wave, not only can they raise the top line, as I mentioned before, they can cut costs by nine to 26% and increase enterprise value uh, by you know, six to nine percent. So it's significant, Dave. It's not, it's not just a place to put stuff, it's a place to really drive your business. And all this big data, George, has given the cloud something to do. We were kind of wondering for years. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's first it took out OPEX, but big data, it's sort of, like if you ask, a digression, if you, if you want to know what a dog's looking for, it's more dogs. They're pack animals. <laughs> if you want to know what data's looking for, it's more data. <laughs> it's just because context is what makes data richer. More data gives you more context. All right, Riaz, give you the final word on uh, you know, the bumper sticker on Inforum 2016. What, what should the takeaways be? Things you've, you've talked about, learned, summarize it for us. You know, in, in my mind, Inforum is really about three things, right? Number one, it's really about understanding that Infor is leading with the cloud. And, and we're doing this in a very tangible and substantial way. Number two, it's about customers. You saw a lot of them stand up on stage, you saw a lot of them at the executive forum. Customers are excited about the value that they're able to drive using uh, our technology and our solutions. And finally, Inforum is, uh, is a real peek into the future, not just for Infor, but I, I believe uh, business software in general. Because if you think about some of the things we're doing, taking IoT, uh, putting uh, predictive analytics in the cloud, uh, helping customers drive value, and most importantly, helping customers improve and find new ways to grow their business, I think it's a great window into the future of our industry. Riaz, thanks very much for coming back in theCUBE. Really a pleasure having you. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. George and I will be back with our next guest. We're live here at Inform 2016. This is theCUBE.